Good morning. morning. It's so good to be able to hear that back again. It is a lot less lonely than me standing staring at a camera on a Friday afternoon or a Saturday morning. But it's so good to uh, to be with you. It's so good to see uh, so many here as we join together and as we uh, worship uh, again. Um, What a a great Sunday this is for us to be back again. The first time in 12 weeks, the first Sunday uh, in three months. Every uh, Sunday is our opportunity, we know, to remember and to worship our Saviour who not only has died for us but but he has risen again and today we come together on that day when when the whole world stops to acknowledge the whole world stops to realize that he is risen he is risen indeed so it's so good to be back and so good to be back on this particular Sunday and our prayer is and our hope is that we will continue to be back from now on that we won't have any more stoppages or breaks or, or, or whatever else so that is our hope and, mm-hmm. and our prayer certainly over the next little while we will continue to meet once a week at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning we haven't got the UK for any other gatherings or meetings yet but each and every Sunday morning we'll be here at 11 o'clock coming to worship together uh, and to allow us to do that, to allow us to continue to do that, we're going to follow the, uh, the COVID-19 measures and restrictions and continue to be there. And I'm sure we're, we're all well versed in those by now, but it's the same uh, measures that were in place up until uh, the new year. We're going to continue to follow that. So two metre distancing, one way system, wearing a mask and, uh, and if we can avoid gathering in numbers uh, either inside or outside the building, that, that will be really helpful as well. I know that's difficult. Uh, for us, you know, it's difficult, especially when we maybe haven't seen each other for a while and whenever we want to catch up. But if we can avoid gathering or huddling in numbers, either inside or outside, that will, that will be helpful for us as we're able to continue to uh, to meet together. And just two other announcements. The one is to say that I'm, I'm going to take some leave this week, and so the Reverend uh, John Woodside will be leading our worship next Sunday. That's Sunday the 11th um, of April. Uh, And if you have uh, any pastoral needs this week, please do not hesitate to get in touch uh, with any elder uh, and they will be able to to help you uh, with that. And I plan to be back on Monday the the 12th um, of April. And we finish with uh, some great news and that's to say that Anna and Ryan, uh, our two most recent communicants here uh, in Alexandra Presbyterian Church, are are now parents. They're parents uh, to a beautiful baby girl. Um, Anna Grace, who was born on Thursday, so we we want the rich. Oh, I'm getting a I'm getting a shake of the head. Uh, oh, sorry, Eva Eva Grace Eva Grace. Sorry, Anna and Ryan have had Eva Grace. I've got it wrong already. Uh, Eva Grace, um, and we want to, to wish them God's richest blessings, and we're we're really looking forward to uh, to meeting her whenever uh, she's able to be out here uh, among us. Don't get her name wrong, like I have. And we'll be we'll be all right. Look, we are here to worship together this morning. Our call to worship on this Resurrection Sunday comes from John chapter 11. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, and even though they die, whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus asked. Well, this morning we do come as people of the risen King. We're going to stay seated as we sing, just as we had done over the the past number of months leading up to the new year. We're going to stay seated as we praise and as we remember that we are people of the risen King.
Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that whatever situation we find ourselves in, Lord, whatever, uh, Lord, is happening or has happened in our lives, Lord, whether we come with full hands or empty hands, Lord, whether we come with uh, stories of, of battles won or, or struggling in the fight, Lord, we thank you that on this resurrection day we can come, Lord, with rejoicing in our hearts, Lord, with a joy that is deep placed in our hearts. Or we can come with that because we look today at an empty cross and we look also at an empty tomb. Or we look to the cross where our sin was paid for, where our Saviour gave up his spirit, where he died to, to rescue us, to, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness as your word tells us. Father, we are thankful that not only is the cross empty, but so too is the tomb. So too is the tomb where he was laid, where he was wrapped and, and where he was left. Where it seemed like hope had gone and hope had died with him. And yet Lord we thank you that death was unable to hold him. He was unable to match his power and his might and his sovereignty over every single thing. And so Lord we come with that deep sense of joy in our hearts. Lord as we, as we look to Jesus as we fix our eyes on Christ, the one that you promised and the one you sent. The one who promised that he would live and he would die and he would rise again. And the one who kept his promise. And Lord, thank you that he not only told us about this, but Lord, he showed us. Not only did he talk about these things, but he has proven it. And so Lord, we thank you that we look to him and we know that, that just as he promised, whoever believes in him will live. Even though we die this earthly death, even though we will pass from this world one day, Lord, we thank you that that eternal promise remains for us as we hope and trust and put our faith in him. And Lord, we also come this morning realising, Lord, what took him to the cross. We come confessing. Lord, we come confessing that Lord, each and every one of us gathered here has sinned. Lord, we have done this with the thoughts of our mind. We have done this with the words of our mouths. And we have done this with the actions of our hands. Lord, we realise that there was no other way for, for our sin to be paid for. And so, Lord, we come confessing as well as rejoicing. Lord, thank you for those three words that Jesus uttered as he was on the cross. Thank you for those three words which tell us that as we confess that our sins are dealt with. It is so Lord, may we look to him and may we have that inexpressible joy because of Jesus, because of what he has done, because of his new life and because of his assurance for us, even sinners just like us. Lord, help us as we join together to draw near to you and to know that you are the one who draws near to us. Or may we know that as we hear your word read, as we sing praise, as we come to you in prayer and as we would open up your word together here. Lord, this is our prayer. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. I'm going to ask if uh, Mervyn, our clerk of session, will come and bring us our reading this morning. Morning. Our reading this morning is taken from 1 Peter um, chapter 1. And we're going to read the first nine verses. First Peter 1. To God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation 
that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Amen. <coughs> Thanks to everyone for, uh, for reading for us from God's Word this morning. Well, I want to say a big hello to all the children in the congregation, especially uh, at this moment in time. Where you're scattered um, around the church, so you can stay wherever you are. But I want to say a big uh, hello to you. And I also want to ask you a question um, this morning. Hands up anybody who has been given some chocolate so far this week. So chocolate eggs, chocolate bunnies, chocolate whatever. Hands up if you've got some chocolate. Okay. Jordan and Kyle Barr's hand were the first up. They've, they've definitely still got something. Okay, if you're, if you're not uh, a child in the congregation, hands up this morning if you've got any chocolate uh, so far this week. Okay, I think the vast majority of us have, haven't we? We would feel a little bit let down, I think, if we didn't get at least some chocolate, whether we had to buy it for ourselves or someone give it to us um, as a gift. I think we would feel a little bit let down at this time of the year. Well, before you go today, after you, you finish at KFC, there'll be a little bit of chocolate for you to take with you, just a little bit, because if it's in like our house, you could start a shop and sell it on and pass it on. So there's just a little bit of chocolate for you to take home. But there's also something else. There is one of these uh, little books, little books from Scripture Union for you to take home with you as well today. And before you go out to Kessie, I want to explain a little bit of what this book, uh, the one that's on the screen, is um, all about. It is a book that helps to tell us what Easter means for us. It helps to tell us what Easter is all about. Sometimes we get a little bit caught up, don't we, in the other things that we get given at this time of the year, especially chocolate. And sometimes we think Easter is all about chocolate, or it's all about bunnies, or chicks, or flowers, or things to do with spring, things to do with this time of the year. But this book helps to explain what Easter is really all about. It's really all about God's love for us, and it's really all about God's mighty plan for us and for the world. God's plan is Jesus not only died, but, but he rose again uh, for us. And it also, uh, this little book, as well as telling us that, it has something for us to do in some of the pages. It has some things for us to colour in. Some pages you will find full of lots of colour and life and all the rest of it, and some you will need to colour in yourselves. I know that some of you will love that, and some of you maybe won't be all that fussed about it, but that is there for you to do maybe this week as you're off school. And maybe whenever you colour your pages in, maybe it will look a little bit like this. Maybe it will be full of colour, different colours. It will come to life as you colour it in, as you take time uh, to do that. And you know, whenever I was looking through this little book this week, I thought to myself, you know what, this is a lot like what God does for us. This is a lot like how God deals with us in our lives. Because as we think about Easter, as we think about God's love for us, and as we think about God's plan for us, this is what he does in our lives. This is what he does for us. He comes to give us new life. He comes to give us life forever. And how did Jesus describe that to us? How did he describe that to his disciples, the life that he came to give us? Well, this is what he says in John chapter 10, verse 10, and this is from the message translation. It's maybe a little bit different to how we normally read it, but this is what Jesus said to his disciples and to us. 
He says, I have come so that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Who is the they that Jesus is talking about? He's talking about us. He's talking about everybody who believes in him. And you know, whenever I was looking through this book this week, I thought this, this is a really good picture. This is a really good illustration of what God does for us, how he comes to bring us this new life. Because you know, life without Jesus is a little bit like that. It looks and it seems and it is a lot like all the other pages, but there's something missing, isn't there? There's something that isn't quite there. There's something that isn't there to make it all as it was meant to be. And then whenever we add color, what happens? It comes to life. It's completely different. It is as it's meant to be. And that's the change that Jesus makes for us. That's why Jesus came and he lived and he died and he rose again. So that he could give us life like this. And that was God's plan for us. And whenever we follow Jesus, whenever we put our trust in him, that's what happens for us. What does Jesus say? Life that is more and better than we ever dreamed of. Just like this page. It's come to life. It's full of colour. It is just as it was meant to be. And that's why Easter is good news for us. That's why we want to always remember what it means for us. God's love and God's mighty plan. The change that it makes for us as we put our hope and trust in him. So there'll be one of these waiting for you as you make your way out of KFC this morning. Make sure you take one and you take a little bit of chocolate that is on offer as well. Maybe you'll have some time this week when you're off school to make your way through it, not only to read it and to hear it, but also to see some of the pages that are coloured in. As we do that, we can remember what Jesus does for us. He gives us life more and better than we ever dreamed of. Okay, so if the leaders and the children want to, to make their way out uh, now to KFC, you can do it. The, the crash facilities are also there for any parents who would like to use that in them. <coughs> let's join for our prayers of intercession before we come to open up God's word together. Let's pray again. Lord God, as we join together on this resurrection Sunday, as we come to remember that Jesus is alive, Lord, we are especially aware that we bring our prayers to, to the one who has shown his power, to the one who has displayed his power through the empty tomb, to the one who reminds us that he is more powerful than anything that will come our way or anything that we will face in this life. And so, Father, this morning we want to come to you in prayer, Lord, remembering that, that not only are you more powerful than everything, but, Lord, also that you are the one who, who understands. Just as Christ lived, just as he walked this earth, just as he journeyed to the cross, Lord, we realise that you're the one who completely understands our pain, our frailties, our worries. Lord, the imperfections of this world that we live in. We come to remember that Jesus is the one who has suffered unjustly. And so, Lord, as we suffer, Lord, as we make our way through this life and all the difficulties that comes our way, we thank you that we can come to the one who, who understands. The one who has walked this path, the one who has come and seen and known everything for yourself. And Lord, on this resurrection Sunday, we 
Lord, but to remember that we continue through these strange times in our world. We continue through lockdown and restrictions. Lord, we know that the frustrations that that has brought and continues to bring. We know that the worry and anxiety and strife that that brings to many families and households. And yet, Lord, we are also mindful of the extra time that it has given to us. Or the extra time to spend with our loved ones, with our family. Even with those that we maybe have spent time with over the phone. Checking in with them and keeping up to date with. Lord, we pray that we might see, Lord, some of the things that you are doing through this time. Through this time that tells us that we are not in control of all things. Lord, we are not sovereign and powerful and know the end from the beginning. So, Lord, help us to lean into you. Lord, help us to have our eyes open to know, Lord, even the blessings that you have given us through times such as this. So we pray for families. We pray for brothers and sisters. We pray for parents and children, for grandparents, for aunts and uncles, for those maybe we've been separated from for a long time. Lord, may we know that you're the one who cares for us and uh, and all of our families. Lord, we also want to pray for our community. Lord, we have seen over recent days that there has been a a real increase in tension and in trouble. Lord, our prayer is that you would bring peace and that you would bring calm. You would bring influential voices that would speak these things, that would not look to stir up trouble. Lord, that would bring peace and that would bring calm to our communities. We pray for those who are in our security forces. We pray for those, especially in the police, who who really bear the brunt of these types of things. Or we know that they are someone's husband or wife, someone's son or daughter. So, Father, we pray for them as they are unsure what a new day or a new week will bring as they go to their place of work. And Father, all of these things we bring before the one who is our risen, who is our death defeating, and who is our reigning saviour. We pray these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I wonder if the the date, the 20th of July, 1969, I wonder if that brings any significance to you. Well, that was the date that man first walked on the moon. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, and all of those other things. A very, very significant date, a very memorable moment, a very significant moment in time for our world. I wouldn't for one second cast aspersions on those who may or may not be able to remember that uh, date of uh, 20th of July 1969. But even for those of us who were born afterwards, this is a a, a monumental moment in history. Some people are hugely into spaceships and rockets and space travel and all those things. And no doubt they could tell us many more things to do with that and what has happened since. And other people aren't really. Other people see it as a, an item in the news and it passes them by. But either way, this is a big moment in the history of the world, isn't it? This is a significant moment of what has happened in our history, the history of the world. But here's a question for us all this morning. Not only do you remember that date, not only do you know what happened on that date, but what difference does this monumental moment in history make to you, make to your life, day to day, or week by week? I would hazard a guess and say not an awful lot. I doubt it means an awful lot to your life, day by day, or week by week. I doubt it makes much of an impression on your life. I doubt it makes much of an impression on the decisions you make or even maybe how you see the world. Man landing on the moon was a hugely significant moment in history. But if we're honest, it doesn't have a lot of significance for us personally. Maybe that sounds something like how the resurrection is for some people. Maybe that sounds a little bit like how it is for you. 
Today is, of course, Easter Sunday. It's the day, like every Sunday, where we can remember that Jesus has rose from the dead. But maybe, maybe that's how you see the resurrection. Maybe that's what the resurrection is like for you. A very significant moment in history. Yes, maybe, possibly. But not something that affects how you live your life. Not something that affects how you make your decisions or how you see the world. Passage that Mervyn read for us just a short while ago from 1 Peter says to us very clearly that that is not how it should be for the Christian. That is not how it should be if your faith and my faith is in Jesus. In fact, Peter says that it has everything to do with how we live our lives. The fact that Jesus has been risen from the dead should affect how we live our lives every single day. What Peter writes at the very beginning of of that letter uh, is really important. It gives us a a very important tone for what he writes next. It gives us a very important context for what he says. He opens his letter by writing to God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia uh, and Asia. And it seems a, a, an odd way, doesn't it? It seems a strange way for Peter to open up this letter to describe the people that he is writing to. He didn't start it like he started other letters, brothers and sisters or God's faithful or uh, God's people. But instead he starts off by writing to strangers in the world. And that's because that's what they were, strangers in the world, strange to the world around them. They didn't act like everyone else around them. They didn't seem to be like everyone else that was around them. What made them this way? What made Peter describe them as strangers? Well, these believers, as they were scattered throughout the empire in these different places that he mentions, they were different because of the choices that they made. They were different because of how they lived their lives and their communities, uh, different in how they lived their lives to their neighbours, their friends, and maybe even to their family members. See, in these days of the early Christians, they were different quite often by the things that they no longer did. By the things that they thought they needed to do, but realise now that they didn't. Things maybe like sacrificing and worshipping idols, they didn't need to do that anymore. And we say to ourselves, well, maybe, maybe others, maybe those who weren't Christians, were their hearts always sincere? Were their hearts always full of reverence to these gods and idols that they would have worshipped to and sacrificed, I doubt it. But they still did it. They still did it, maybe more for superstition and maybe more for just in case than anything else. And sometimes that's how religion works, isn't it? Sometimes that's how all types of religion works, just in case, keep myself right. But Christians realised that those types of things were not what they needed to do anymore. Because they worshipped the one who was the creator and the sustainer of the whole universe. They didn't need to bow before. They didn't need to make offerings to any of these other gods or idols that were before them. They didn't need to worship anything else just in case. And the difference was probably also seen in how they they refused to cut corners in their work or their business dealings. How they refused to uh, cheat Caesar in the tax that he was due even though they probably really didn't want to be paying it. Why? Not because they were good living, but because no matter what they did, whether big or small, significant or not, they realised that they did it for the glory of God now. And they were strangers in the world because, well, they lived in a world that didn't recognise their faith, didn't go along with their faith. Imagine a world without Christmas holidays. Imagine a world that doesn't recognise that actually this is Easter Sunday. It's hard for us to imagine, isn't it? It's hard for us to imagine because that's the way it has always been for us. When we celebrate Jesus' birth, the whole world stops. When we come to think about Christ's death and his resurrection, everybody's calendar is set by that as well. But not for these Christians, not for these believers. They were strangers in the world. And maybe maybe we can see our world moving along similar lines. Maybe the the difference between how we see the world as followers of Jesus is shifting further and further and further away from the culture around us. 
the intertwining that has been there between Christianity and the Word, or at least our part of the Word, maybe it's becoming picked apart bit by bit by bit. The Word doesn't think the same as us on lots of things anymore. It looks to us and it not only sees some of the things we think and believe and practice as outdated, but maybe they see it as dangerous as well. We are becoming more and more like strangers in the world that we live in. And so what are we to do? What are we to think about? What are we to know? What have we got to hold on to as strangers in the world? Well, the answer is today. Today is what we have got to hold on to. What we're holding on to is the resurrection. Not only because this is Easter, but because this is Sunday. Because this is the day of the week that he rose again. And every time we gather, every time we worship on this first day of the week, we are celebrating that fact. We are acknowledging that he has been risen. And that's what Peter underlines in what he writes next. To those who are scattered throughout the empire, it's the resurrection that Peter wants to highlight, wants to point to, and wants to remind them to hold on to. And it's what we, as maybe we increasingly feel like strangers in the world, are to remember and are to hold on to as well. And it's because of the difference that it makes to our lives every day. What difference does it make? Well, Peter tells us, verse 3, he says it gives us a living hope. In his great mercy, Peter writes, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because of Jesus, because of the Saviour who has come, who has lived, who has died, and who crucially has been raised again, we have a living hope. And why is it a living hope? It's a living hope because resurrection equals new life. Not only for Jesus, but for all of us who put our faith in him. It gives us a sure and certain hope that like Jesus, death is not the end for us as well. And it's this new life that is not only for the future, but as we thought about with the children early on, it is for now as well resurrection of Jesus has everything to do with our lives now, here, where we are. And in short, this living hope that we have, it's what makes the Christian distinct. It's what marks us out as being different. Think in your mind's eye of the Jewish rabbi, what, what comes to mind? Maybe that flat black hat and the long beard. Maybe those who are of a Muslim faith, what comes to mind? Maybe the clothing that men and women often wear. Think of a Buddhist, what comes to mind for them? Well, maybe the, the long red shawl springs to mind. Think of lots of religions of this world, and they're distinct because of how they dress, of what they wear. They're distinct because of clothes, aren't they? What about Christians? What about us? What makes followers of Jesus distinct? It's not what we wear. It's not clothing. In fact, it's because of clothing that has been left behind that we are distinct. It's because of grave clothes and strips of linen that weren't needed anymore. That's what makes us distinct. It's because of clothes that were left in the tomb that produces a living hope in us. And there's no other religion. There is no other belief system, atheism, or anything else that could dare to give us that living hope because of clothes that have been left behind. And what does it look like, this living hope? Well, we're offered hope in all sorts of places, aren't we? In today's world, we find the offer of hope everywhere. Politicians, they often offer us hope, elect me, they say, elect us, because our way of doing things, that's the only way to give the rest of us hope. We need to be more liberal. We need to be more conservative, they tell us. We need to be more unionist or nationalist. We need to be more climate focused or whatever their message is. But what political cause has ever given us a living hope? Advertisers, they, they often, <clears throat> pardon me, they often offer us hope, don't they? 
They'll tell us, look at this car. Look at this car. Look at the man driving this car. He has it all. He has style, he has sophistication, he has the clothes to match, he has good looks. This is one happy, contented person. And if you drive this car, maybe that's what your life will be like as well. <clears throat> but there's a very real difference between hype and hope, isn't there? The reality never matches up to the hype. Hype is always found to be wanting. Hype is always found to be a lot emptier than it promised. But Peter, as one commentator reminds us, says that we have hope. We have living hope because of the resurrection. And it's a living hope that endures. Isn't that what Peter goes on to say? That though now for a little while you might have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, they have come so that they may prove the genuineness of your faith. The good news of Jesus, his life, his death and his resurrection never claims that our life will be straightforward. Never makes that clear. In fact, Jesus warns the disciples, doesn't he, <clears throat> that there will be trials of all kinds because of their faith in this. So there's no empty hype that is offered by the gospel. But there is living hope. There is a living hope which perseveres through every situation and trial and difficulty. There is a living hope that will outlast all of those things, no matter how difficult that is to see in the here and the now. And that means for all of us, that means whether we're here or whether we're listening or watching later, that means for every single one of us, there is a living hope that is offered. A living hope that is offered as we trust in Jesus. A living hope that is offered to the single parent. A living hope that is offered to the lonely pensioner. A living hope that is offered to the stressed student. A living hope that is offered to the person fearful of the future. A living hope that is offered to the terminal patient, whoever you are, if your faith is in Jesus, Peter is talking about you. And why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. And what does that leave us with? It leaves us, he says, with an inheritance. With an inheritance that can never perish or spoil or fade. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. See, this living hope that is within all of us, within those who have faith in Jesus, it reminds us that we have something. We already have something in our hands. Something that can't be taken away from us. Something that is constantly pointing us to the future. Constantly saying, don't forget what is to come. Something that Peter will go on to say is so much more valuable than silver or gold or anything else that's, that's valuable in this world as economy. You think of something that's silver or gold, something that we see in a jeweler's window, a beautiful necklace, an expensive ring, things that are uh, valuable and long-lasting. Maybe that's the sort of thing that's in your inheritance. Maybe that's the sort of thing that you're looking forward to inheriting from a parent or a grandparent or somebody else. Things that will one day be yours. There's no sure thing, you think, because you have been promised that thing or those things. Parents don't break promises and it's, it's written down anyway. It's written down in a will and, and it's given this solicitor to keep. So even if somebody did try to take it away from us, they couldn't. There is no sure thing, we think, that an inheritance like that. Except there is. There is a sure thing than that. It's the inheritance that Peter tells us about here. An inheritance that tells us just as death is not the end for Jesus, so it is not the end for us, for people like you and me. It's an inheritance which shows us that for now, yes, we see like a reflection in a mirror, but it tells us one day we will see him face to face. It's an inheritance that tells us that now we know and we understand in part, but one day, one day we will know fully. One day, when it, that day comes, we will see him and we will know and an inheritance that tells us that one day he will wipe away every tear from eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Because the old order of things, that is finished. It is gone. It is no more. 
an inheritance that tells us that one day his home will be our home for eternity. Sometimes that's hard for us to get our heads around, isn't it? Eternity that awaits us with him. But this is the truth. This is our inheritance. This is what it's constantly pointing us forward to. This is what it's saying you have in your hands and there is no sure thing. And that's why we have a living hope. And what does it mean, finally, does Peter say? It means we have an inexpressible and a glorious joy. I wonder who you think would be best placed to tell us about these things. Who do you think would be best placed to describe the resurrection and what it means for us, what it means for our everyday? Who do you think would be best placed? Maybe someone who had seen it all, even from before that moment in time. Maybe somebody who was an eyewitness, who saw for themselves, who could smell, who could see, who could touch, who could hear, who witnessed it for themselves. Maybe somebody who didn't always get it right when they followed Jesus. Maybe somebody who made a lot of mistakes, actually, as they followed Jesus. Somebody who knew firsthand the distance that sin puts between us and him. Maybe somebody like Peter. Somebody who wrote these words. Because Peter ticks all of these boxes, doesn't he? As we read through the New Testament. I'll never leave you, Jesus. Even if the rest do, not me. I'll, I'll never let that happen. And yet, of course, he, he did let that happen. He did that three times before sunrise and Good Friday. The agony of denying his master and his Lord. Watching him head to the cross. Knowing he had failed him. And believing that was the end of the story. But then who is one of the first on the scene? Who is one of the first after the women come back with the story? Well, Luke tells us that it is Peter. Peter hears what the women has to say as they went to uh, deal with Jesus' body. And in his eagerness, he runs to the tomb. He doesn't stop until he gets there. Maybe he is fueled by what has happened, by his denial, his betrayal, by getting it so badly wrong. But he is one of the first on the scene. And he gets there and he doesn't find any angels. In fact, he doesn't find anything at all. Because the stone has been rolled away and there's just an empty tomb and clothes that has been left behind. What does Luke's gospel tell us about Peter? It tells us that he went away marvelling at what had just happened. We can imagine him, can't we, walking back almost in a daze, jaw on the floor. Can this really be true? He asks himself. Has this really happened? He marvels at what he has seen, or rather at what he has not seen. But that's not the only thing that happens. Because he encounters Jesus, doesn't he? He encounters the risen Jesus for himself. Where? On a beach. Because he and the other disciples have gone back to the only thing that they really knew, and that was fishing. But it's there that they encounter Jesus. It's there that Jesus seeks Peter out and G Peter is restored. It's a tender, beautiful picture of God's grace and action, isn't it? Not treating Peter as he should have been treated. And what did it mean for Peter? What was he left with? Well, he describes it so perfectly, doesn't he, in verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And you're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith. The salvation of your souls. The you that Peter is talking about is us. It's people like you and me. We haven't seen him, but we love him. We don't see him right now, but we believe in him. That means that our hearts this morning, and that means that our hearts every Sunday morning as we come, it can be filled with what he talks about here. It can be filled with this inexpressible joy, this joy that we can't really give an expression to, that we don't really have the words for, but it's inexpressible, and it's glorious, and it's deep down. And it's telling us that one day, one day he's going to bring about the end result of our faith. The end result of seeing him, knowing him, 
on being with him. The resurrection, a significant moment in history, isn't it? But it's one with an even greater significance for us. Every day of our lives, even if, even if we feel we're living like strangers in the world, even if we feel like we're going through trials of all kinds, the resurrection has the most significance for us of anything that has happened. A joy of knowing, like Peter did, that we too are sinners saved by grace. A joy of knowing, just like Peter did, that yes, we have failed, we continue to fail, but our failure is paid for, that we are restored. Death is dead, love has won, Christ has conquered, and we shall reign with him. Why? For he lives. Christ is risen from the dead. Let's sing that now as we stay seated, as we sing our closing hymn together. See what a more. of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all both now and forevermore. Amen. Just a reminder before we go, uh, if anyone has uh, a child in KFC, maybe one parent can come and collect them from the hall. Um, and also if we can make our way out just as we uh, had been doing up until the new year, uh, maybe the, this half of the ground floor followed by this half uh, and then upstairs that will help us just to manage the, the flow uh, of people but I want to thank you uh, for your, your cooperation I know we'll get back into the habit of doing things slightly differently as we, we need to do but it, it is so good to be back it's much better to be back and to be gathered rather than uh, maybe joining in our pyjamas at 1 minute to 11 or whatever your practice was I don't know but it's so good to be back and to be with uh, one another have a, a really good Easter and, uh, and a break together so thank you mm -hmm.